Good morning, everybody. We'll be starting up here in about uh, two minutes. Yeah, maybe two minutes. We'll get people old. And while you're waiting, you can get ready to do your polls. You know, we'll do those here. Um, and also open up your Q&A and your chat pods. So we're all set to go. Another minute or so. Again, uh, we'll be starting at the top of the hour. If you open up your chat pod, we'll give you links to both, so you don't have to type in the Poll Everywhere site if you don't already have it, or to the handout. That, that's what the chat will be good for. And then uh, the Q&A, we'll definitely be using that. So make sure you're ready with your questions in the Q&A. And for some of you, I know you can't do Poll Everywhere, so you can put in your answers that way. It is the top of the hour, but we'll give folks about 30 seconds to finish logging on and then we'll get started. Okay, good morning. And uh, I know the weather outside doesn't make us think this way, but it is time to be thinking about snow and ice. Uh, getting ready for the late fall and winter. We're talking as we're getting ready this morning, uh, Amanda, Jody, and I, that, you know, we're ready for fall. But uh, I know a lot of you are trying to button things up and get ready for the end of the year. I'm David Orr. I'm the director here with the uh, New York State LTAP Corner Looker Roads Program. Uh, Hopefully everybody is having yourself a good day and hopefully you're here to learn a bit about snow and ice. We're just doing an overview. You know, I'll give you some updates for how you get more information for those who are curious. Again, uh, we're gonna be doing polls and we'll go ahead and get started here. Now, if you haven't been on one of our webinars before, I know some of you have heard this multiple times, but again, down at the bottom of your screen, your audio settings, uh, your chat pod, open that up just because that's where we're going to put in a link to the handout and a link to Poll Everywhere so you don't have to memorize it. You can just click on the link uh, and information such as if you can't access the uh, handout, you can email Amanda. Uh, she'll put her email address in there for you. You can raise your hand. I'll be asking you to do that a few times and just to make sure everybody's listening and is on the page, go ahead and raise your hands up. Let's see how this works here. Make sure everybody's on page here. Okay. Be at least happy. Okay, and then magically, all of them are going to dro be dropped. It's, we can lower all of them next to Okay, and then uh, again, I'm going to use the Q&A to answer questions. And if for, for some of you, you know, you don't have access, I know, to poll everywhere, you can use that to put in your questions. This particular webinar is going to be worth one professional development hour for engineers uh, here in New York State. In this case, though, unlike in some of our webinars, you can have a group of people, but only the person registered will get the PDH. It is considered a course. If you're not from New York State, we'll find that out in just a minute. You'll need to check with your LTAP center in New York State. Okay. So welcome. And again, uh, sometimes you're like, wow, it seems like it's early to be thinking about 
snow and ice, but actually, truth be told, probably should have been thinking about it even before, because we're, I know, in the middle of budget season for a lot of you as well. But let's do a few polls to see who's on today and also help me out to figure out what we're going to concentrate on. So, oh no. You were working literally five minutes ago. Okay. I have to fill out my field here. Because it's going to make me do this and there's just no way around it. But the cool thing is, this should work. And you can see. And then of course we have our lovely duo. We have dual safety for everything. Yes, this is my device. Ah, uh, technology. Well, are you going to be stubborn today? This is just bizarre. There we go. There we go. <laughs> hey, technology actually works. So who do you work for? You work for a town, a county, the state or fed, consultant, city or village, tribal, contractor. And we have somebody there who's honest and they work for the weekend. Okay, that's cool. Okay, it's good to know. Wow, we got a blend here today, Amanda and Joey. Uh, we got some consultants, we got some town folks, state and fed. Okay, cool. Okay. Let's see what the next one is. What's your job? Are you an administrator, an engineer, highway superintendent, or a DBW commissioner? Are you in the field? Are you a crew supervisor, uh, town supervisor, you know, board member, things like that? I'd, I'd like to know that too. And then, of course, none of the above. So let's see. A lot of engineers today, probably because it's worth that PDH. And yeah, you can type in a letter in the QA if you don't know for sure. I've got an additional highway superintendent. Okay. And of course, like uh, most things, not everybody's voting. Okay. Okay, so we got a bunch of engineers. And then lastly, where are you from? In this case, you get to click on the map. Click on the map, tell me where you're from. Okay, we got uh, quite a variety of folks. Cool, that's good to know. Okay. And then uh, we got somebody knows they're with a village. We got somebody from Pennsylvania, or they just clicked on the bottom of the map. I'll, I'll assume Pennsylvania. Could always adjust it. Okay. So we got folks up uh, all over the place. And somebody out in their boat out on, out on Long, uh, Long Island there. That's cool. Okay. That's probably the person who wasn't like Ontario. They went around. Okay. Now, just so you know, we got three more of uh, this season's foundational webinars. I put them on the screen. I called them Y webinars. It fits in the space. We got the one today. We got one next week on equipment and then one on the planning process right after Labor Day. And then we'll be stopping for a while uh, with our fall workshop season uh, through the Bridge Conference. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of today's webinar. So let's just talk about what we're going to talk about today. I'd like to do that sometimes. We're going to be talking about the weather. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about level of service uh, for your roadways, materials that we can use, equipment. Obviously, there's relationship there. Uh, what are you going to be using for your routes and questions about actually strategies of plowing the road? Um, and then what do you do with emergencies? And of course, this all leads to the fact that we need to have policies in place. OK? So to get started with this, the first question I've got for you to help a bit and something to think about is, why is snow and ice critical? Give me one word. If you want to put multiple words in, just realize they're going to show up. They're going to do a little whirl. So let's see what people think. One word. Put one word. And you can put in more than one. You're okay to do that. Just... Safety so far is winning. Okay. Safety in the Q&A is winning. Okay. Changing conditions, driving, damage, snowman. Ooh, gotta have snowman out there. Yeah. Okay. Maintenance, sleep. Okay. So safety is by far our winning uh, champion today. 
Sledding. Okay, we got some people sledding today. That's okay too. Okay. So safety is by far the biggest issue, but there are other reasons to think about good quality snow and ice control. And uh, my three pictures remind me of the three things I want to think about. Obviously, safety is number one. It's not in the top left corner, but it is number one. It has to come back to safety. But part of it is commerce and getting from point A to point B. You don't have well-maintained roads. How do you get vehicles? How do you get deliveries? How do you get that beer, milk, and bread? You know, everybody panics about when there's a big event coming down the road. But the other thing to think about is if we're doing a good job with our snow and ice control, we're actually doing a pretty good job of environmental control. We need to worry about that. Too much salt we know can create problems. So the goal is to use the right amount of whatever we're using to help make sure the roads are as safe as possible and commerce can get from point A to point B without oversalting and creating damage. Okay. So what kind of winter weather are you going to have to deal with this year? Any guesses on what you think you might see? What kind of winter weather? Ice? Yeah. Hopefully not too much ice, but ice is an issue. Sleep? Yeah. We can get sleep this time of year even. I've seen some hail this year. Not quite seen. It's a lot of snow. Snow's obviously our big one. Okay. And I think you can actually click on them and highlight and go, yeah, I agree with that if you want. Cold, freezing rain. Ooh, freezing rain. Ooh, nobody likes that. Rain and flooding, which can be a result of snow melt. Yeah. We have to deal with that as well. And that's all part of that whole winter winter process that we have to deal with. And we know things are changing and we hope it's not heavy as usual. Last year was an interesting year. Certainly didn't match the normal pattern that we might expect to see uh, here in New York State. These are ma a map that was generated a few years ago of the average amount of snowfall that you see in New York State in inches. Okay. So there are parts of New York State, especially along the end of the two lakes, Erie and Ontario, they get hundreds of inches per year. And that's what they're used to. But again, last year, very, very different. A lot of snow out west early with some really big storms, but generally overall, we didn't see a huge amount of snow. And as somebody put in the Q&A just now, yeah, that can lead to trees down and power outages. Winter is an interesting time, okay? Who knows what's gonna happen this year? I don't know for sure, but I know we have to be ready for it. And one of the things that's always challenging is there's that push to not have more in the budget that you need, but you can't just shoot for the average of year. You have to really shoot for sort of a worst case year, but not the worst case year. Okay. So maybe eight out of nine years, be ready for it, and then go from there. Now, in terms of the winter weather patterns we have to deal with, most of our weather coming here to New York State generally comes from west to east, okay? And if it comes across the country, it's not as a huge amount of snow. It's not usually even that super, super cold. That's actually was the dominant pattern we saw a lot of last year, which is part of the reason we didn't get the big quantities of the really, really cold weather that we might get in some years. But as we get go the weather going up and down, we get cycles, we can get a couple of different kind of weather effects that can make a big difference to us. We can get polar vortex and the Alberta clipper, weather main flow comes from the north. Usually this is caused because you're getting a cycle in the upper atmosphere, and it's going to bring with it lots of cold, cold weather. And of course, if it's just at the right angles, it'll go across those Great Lakes, pick up the snow, and you get the Finger Lakes snow effect. That it's an interesting phenomenon. I've talked to friends outside of New York State, and it's something that you have to experience to really understand that you can get five feet of snow and then five miles away, you get nothing. And it's just the way it goes. So, but that's an interesting thing we have to deal with. And we always used to get a few of those. That's part of what led to the big snows last year, but that's an issue. In terms of the larger quantities of snow, our biggest issue we get usually are these snowstorms that are really starting in the Gulf of Mexico. The weather comes up and it matches up with cold weather coming from the north and you get a big cyclone and it creates lots of snow or even worse, a nor'easter goes out into the Atlantic and then curls back on. That's the northeast. The storm comes from the north and the east and swirls around and brings us huge quantities of snow. 
And that's a general over the entire state. So we got to be ready for any of these storms. And of course, as temperatures change, that could be snow, it could be ice. And of course, the public doesn't always want to slow down. And we already said safety was a number one issue that we want to deal with. So let's talk a little bit about the level of service that you've got on your system or that you might want to think about having. And of course, one of the things with level of service is the stopping distance, okay? Now, we could spend a whole bunch of time on stopping uh, issues here, but let's just sort of think about this from the standpoint of what is the stopping distance on a roadway versus dry conditions? So on a dry day, you might be able to stop in a few hundred feet. A day like today, at least here in Ithaca, the pavement is damp. Okay, we're expecting some rain off and on, so it's going to take longer. So if you could stop in 200 feet uh, at the speed you're traveling, you're going to have to go an additional 70%. So you're going to be 340 feet at that point. As we get into winter and we start getting slush or we get uh, packed snow, um, you may have to double that distance. And so people are supposed to slow down. But again, they don't always do so. Soft, loose snow is going to take even longer. And of course, you get a little bit of light traffic on a road that's just been sanded. It actually gets a little slick spots on it. So you have to have even more distance. And of course, snowpack, got to have even more. And don't even ask about ice, because while I put in six, reality is if it's a black ice situation or a smooth ice situation, you stop when you ran into something or you go into the ditch. Now, what does this mean from our standpoint as managers? Well, we have to think about, are there some roads where we need to get out there and be more proactive to keep them from getting iced out, to get the snow off of them? Yes, the public should be slowing down, but we need to be thinking about our management options that are available to us. Obviously, this is what the public wants for their pavement condition goals. They want that road to be dry and be able to go at whatever speed they feel comfortable going. But in a residential area, truth be told, this is excellent. This really is probably as good as you're ever going to get to see shortly after a storm. And heck, even this would probably be okay in a lot of cases. Though, obviously, on a main line road, you might have to go back and target this to be done as quickly as you can after a snow event. Now, one thing we want to be careful of is is you can get ice formed because of traffic conditions and temperature conditions. And now we get a little bit of slipperiness above and beyond what we might want to have. So we're starting to now deal with some safety concerns, especially on our higher speed and our mainline roadways. Now you can't obviously get out there immediately during a snow event. You may get a situation where the road is completely covered. Now we're actually going to hope our signs and our markings and our delineators are off to help people get around corners. And of course, during a snow event itself, people may even need to uh, slow down and get off the roadway. Now, let's just ask you, does your agency have a level of service for snow and ice? Did, do you have a policy? And if so, is it in writing? Is it in your head? You need to develop one. You don't have one or you're not sure. If you put in none of the above, do me a favor and open up the Q&A and throw in there what you uh, mean by that? What do you mean by none of the above? And I got a couple of additional people who have them in writing. And yeah, I would expect the two of you, uh, Andrew and Bill, would have them. Yep. Let's see what other people have. What's the none? Hmm. And there are things you might not be having that as a policy, obviously, if you're working in a consulting firm or something like that. But the key is, uh, yeah, not employed by government agency. But it's something you may want to think about where you live. They probably should have a policy. So even if you're not working for a government agency, you're certainly affected by them. Those first responders should have a policy that's in place. Okay. Now, I can tell you right now, nobody's going to have a policy that says every road has the same level of service. And say, so just by a show of hands, how many of you uh, have a level of service where every road is the same? Anybody have that? I hope I don't see anybody's hands go up. Because that wouldn't make any sense. Um, you wouldn't want to have the same level of service on every single roadway because just of economics, if nothing else. 
And of course, if people are going slow or residential area, you're going to have to get to them last. Now, this is a overhead map of the city of Ithaca, and these lines that are on here are the federal A classifications. So the green is the highest level in federal aid, arterials. Um, you've got the minor arterials, which are the red. You've got the collector system, which is in blue, and everything else is local. That's actually not a bad way to start thinking about your system. Again, depending on if you even have a federal aid road or not. If you're with a town or a really rural county, you're not going to have a lot of variation here. This is a good starting point, but not a finishing point. But again, if you're managing something like the city of Ithaca or a large county, you're going to probably want to maintain your mainline roads at a different level of service than you're going to maintain the roads that are in the back area. And we'll come back to that here in just a minute, but keep that in mind. Now, we're going to switch gears for just a second because it gets interrelated with each other. Let's talk about the materials that are available. <clears throat> Let me take a sip, and while I do, answer a question. How many of you are still using sand as a primary tool? How many of you are using sand? Interesting. We don't have anybody today that's primarily using sand. I will say, going around New York State, a lot of agencies are still using sand as a primary tool, sand mixed with salt. I was out in Connecticut last week talking to a couple of folks, and they're using a lot of sand with salt. So this is not an uncommon thing by any stretch. And you need to have some sand in your toolkit. I can tell you that right now. That's going to be an absolute because if you get really cold temperatures, if you get an ice event, you may need a short-term hit with that sand. But a lot of agencies, probably a majority of agencies now, have switched to a pretty much all-chemical approach. Okay. Okay. So here we have Dan is put in there. He's using a 40%, 60% sand mix. Okay. Well, let's keep that in mind, Dan. We'll come back to that in a little bit. We'll talk about the abrasives. Now, if you're going to use salt, realize that there's a lot of myths out there about salt. We could spend a lot of time talking about salt, but the way salt works is this. It lowers the essentially the melting point or freezing point, if you want to look at it that way, of our mixture, okay? And the three chemicals that are the most common, sodium chloride, i.e. rock salt, magnesium chloride and calcium chloride, actually track on top of each other relatively closely as they get diluted, okay? So while you can get more activation from magnesium and calcium, um, if they get diluted, they're not actually that big of a difference, not as much as most people might think. And the key is, you're putting down with a lot of ice, you're putting down with a lot of salt, I mean snow, you're going to have a lot of dilution available. So that dilution makes a big difference in what's available. And a lot of the products that are out there are still primarily rock salt, okay, sodium fluoride. The key is to put down as little chemical as you need to do the job. And what happens is it lowers that freezing point. You don't get the bond and then either the traffic or better yet a plow is able to push anything off the road so you don't create an ice situation, okay? So in terms of the materials, a lot of people are using salts, but again, we don't wanna to use too many salts. And in terms of ways to do that, well, you can put that down as a solid, you can put things down as a liquid, or you can pre-wet the salt, so it's still mostly a solid, but it's got a pre-wetted surface. And that pre-wetted surface does two things for us. One, it actually, a lot of times that you use calcium or magnesium, it activates a little bit faster, okay? Uh, it can start to dig down, but of course, as soon as that surface coating is gone, it's back to being rock salt. Just keep that in mind. But because it's already wet, it's sticky. It doesn't bounce as much. That pre-wetting actually keeps it in place. And that's part of the reason some people like to use liquids. And here you can see a truck putting down what's called anti-icing. They actually go out before the storm to put things down. Now, why is pre-wetting or liquids something that we recommend? Well, because we don't want to waste it. This is a study done out in Michigan, okay? And they just put down dry salt and dry pavement, okay? And they purposely put 100% of their material right in the center of the road, the center of one third, okay? And then just watch the vehicles go off and drive down the road. And literally within 20, 30 vehicles, about, 
a third of the material was off on the edge. And then another third of the material was gone, it was completely off the road, 30% in total, scattered off onto the shoulder and wasn't doing any good whatsoever. So essentially, to you, for you to get the same effect, you'd have to put down 30% more material. And that's just with a fairly light amount of traffic. On the other hand, just pre-wetting it, not liquid, just pre-wetting the material meant that 80% of it stayed in the center, only about 10% got itself over into the outside lane, and only 2% was gone off on each side. That's pretty cool. That's really what we'd like to be. We don't want to lose that material, and we like to be a little conservative, so this is pretty good. You put it down near the center, some of it goes down to the edge, and guess what? Most of it stays and actually helps deal with the bonding, breaking that snow and ice from forming a bond on the roadway. And of course, this leads to the fact that environmentally, it's better for all the critters to have less salt and all the plants to have less salt while we're still getting the value of the salt helping us out. Now, question for you. I've got two piles, uncovered piles. We'll talk about covers here in a little bit. I've got a pile covered with or uh, excuse me, uncovered pile with all salt, pure salt, sitting in a pile 50 feet in diameter. I've got another pile of sand. I've added in 10% salt so that it won't freeze into a big ball of sand or big mound of sand. And I get a one inch rainstorm, okay? And I collect all the water that runs off of that. And then I figure out how much salt has been dissolved in those containers, okay? So one inch rainstorm, goes through my pile and I collect the salt, okay? So how many of you think, raise your hand, if you think more salt comes off the salt pile? Let's see how many people think. How many think more salt comes off the salt pile? Okay, a few of you think so, okay? Now magically, all the hands are gonna be dropped. All the hands are dropped. Okay. Now, how many of you think the more salt will be coming out of the sand pile? How many think more salt will come out of the sand pile? Okay, just a few of you. So we had a whole bunch on one. And then I'll lower it one last time. How many of you think the amounts are pretty much equal? I've got a couple, but not that many. Interesting. By the way, that's the right answer. The amount of salt that runs off those two piles is within 4%. Um, about 100 pounds would come out of a pure salt pile, and maybe 96 or so would come out of the salt sand pile. That's with only 10% salt. If you get more than that, they'll be pretty much equal. Okay. Essentially, what happens is the water goes through, it becomes saturated with salt, it can't hold any more, and so it's saturated as much as it will and it runs off. And of course, that's completely lost material. You're not gonna really be able to catch it and put it on the roadways. This is just this thing they studied it. So the idea is if you're gonna use salt and sand, if you're using it as sand as an abrasive, great. You just need enough salt to keep it from freezing. It isn't actually gonna change environmentally. And surprisingly on the road, you start doing the math of how much salt value you have out there it may not be as much as you think, or you're actually just putting down as much salt as if you were putting it down straight. And we'll talk about application rates in just a couple of minutes. Now, what is your policy in your agency? Okay. Is it, uh, and you can check all these, by the way. Are you a primarily salt? Are you using salt abrasives? Do you have treated salt where you pre-wet it or added something to it? Are you using liquids? Are you doing anti-icing? This is the idea of pre-treating before the storm. And again, I gave you another category if you're doing others. So let's see what you've got. And again, you can have all of these and some agencies will. And some agencies, if you have a you know, pretty big system, you may need to have all of these tools in your toolkit. Okay, let's see what you got. Okay, so. Of those who voted, almost all of you, it looks like, are saying salt. 
quite a few of you are using abrasives mixed with salt. Uh, some of the treated salt, cool. Uh, liquids, yeah. Anti-icing. And then I've, I've got one other, don't know what the other is, but there's lots of others. We'll talk about a few of those things. But again, it comes back to having that policy, being ready for different types of storms, okay? So let's go back and look at our snow and ice control plan. Do you have a plan in place where you can sort of figure out, hey, we're going to be using these chemicals, we're going to be doing these roads first, and here's our plans and our cycle, okay? Start thinking about putting one together. And if you aren't with an agency, if you're just one of the people that's watching it, um, make sure your local agency has one. It'll save money and do a better job of both giving safety and environment the right mix to make sure everything's in good shape. Now, of course, some of this comes down to the equipment. We do need to have good modern equipment that's available and working in good condition. And we've come a long way since uh, just dragging a blade down the road with some horses. Um, this was actually done still in many places under covered bridges for many years. Um, used to go down with sleighs. If you ever get to the state fair, you can go see old sleighs that were driven on the road system. It's pretty cool. But uh, let's talk about trucks now and other equipment. So uh, how many trucks do you have in your fleet? And we got some big agencies today. Oh, we got a couple of small agencies. Okay. So we got a couple of small agencies. We got less than five. We've got a couple of really large agencies. And then we've got a bunch of you that have got huge fleets, okay? Now that sounds like, oh man, I wish I had that many trucks, but how many miles of road do you have? Or what level of service are you providing? Are you in an urban area where you typically need to have more trucks per mile just to be able to keep up? Because the number of trucks is in of itself just a number. So start thinking about how you're gonna utilize those trucks. How are you gonna utilize your fleet? Okay. What type of trucks do you have? Do you have dump trucks? Are they six wheelers and 10 wheelers? Um, do you have pickup plows and one tons? You know, what kind of attachments do you have on your equipment? That includes your plows, that includes your applicators of, you know, your spreaders, your liquids, things like that. And then, and I put this down in the general term of feedback. What kind of feedback are you providing to the operators to make sure they're really doing a good job? and putting down the right amount of material to handle a particular storm. These are all things that have to be included in your snow and ice control plan, okay? So let's just spend a little bit of time on plows, wings, and shoes. And when we do our full workshop, which I'll talk about here at the end of the webinar, um, we spend an hour talking about all of these different things. Um, so, you know, you can have shoes on the plows and the wings to help them not dig into the pavement, okay? How many of you, raise your hand, um, how many of you use shoes? Let's see how many of you use shoes. Okay, cool. And shoes come in different flavors. Uh, we, again, we could spend a lot of time looking at shoes. The idea is that it carries some of the weight, so it's not right on the plow. You don't damage the plow as much, okay? That's cool. Uh, you could have wings on, on your vehicle. Some people do, do and some people don't, okay? You can have different shapes on the blades. You can have uh, pickup trucks that have got movable blades. Actually, you can have dump trucks with movable blades. You can have live edge plows. Uh, the lower left corner, every foot is a separate plow in a spring system. And so if you're going along a relatively uneven road, it's like a, cuts it a lot better. Okay, so there are things you can look at and you may want to think about your whole fleet. What is it you're going to be trying to do short term and long term? Because again, you may be developing a plan for this year, but you also may want to be thinking about the plans into the future as you're developing your budget. Because we know it can take time to get equipment. I know some of the agencies I've talked to have ordered dump trucks last year and they're just now hopefully going to get them for this year. So something you have to be thinking about long term getting the equipment in. In terms of spreading the materials that you've got, again, you're gonna to have to have spreaders of different types. Uh, you may have to have spreaders that are, you know, in the back of the truck, which is the typical, but heck, some people have put them right under the driver's seat. People seem to love or hate them when they're back there. The advantage of them under the driver's seat right behind the driver is you have it right in front of the driving wheels of the truck. 
The disadvantage is it can be hard to get in. It can be difficult to clean. And of course, if you had to back up for some reason, you're in the wrong spot. Uh, again, you have to look at your own operations and set everything up. Um, you know, the typical is in the back of the truck. You might have a liquid spreader that you've got to put out there, and it can be fairly expensive or it can be fairly cheap. Uh, people have come up with some pretty cool ways to spread the liquids that they're using. Again, think about your system and how many trucks you've got. What's your backup plan when a truck breaks down? Okay. Now, how do we know what kind of material we're putting down? Well, that means we have to have rate control, and systems are getting fancier and fancier. Okay. And there's some pretty good systems that give good feedback to the driver. Uh, but the most important thing with rate control and actually all the controls inside of the truck is that they're understandable, they're clear and easy to understand. And in fact, one of my concerns with some of these sets of equipment is every single knob looks the same. Maybe we need to set up something so they're slightly different. Uh, we can do a little bit of fun with that. But let me ask you, how many of you calibrate your equipment at least once a year? Raise your hand if you calibrate your equipment at least once a year. Cool, everybody should raise your hand. Um, it's not a hard process, but boy, does it come back and save you money later on. Don't just assume that those knobs are putting down what you think they're putting down. Check it versus the material you're actually using. I mean, I would actually advise anytime you get a shipment in, do a quick check. All it takes is get yourself a one square yard piece of cloth, get your equipment up and running in the yard, go down, spread, see what you have, just do a quick check. You want to do a more precise one with a longer distance, that's great too. But the key is you definitely want to calibrate because if you don't, how do you know what you've really got? And when agencies have done this, they found a lot of times that they're way off in terms of what they're spreading, which means either you're putting way too much material down or just as bad, you're not putting enough. And so either the roads aren't being maintained at the level you expect or you're having the drivers have to put the blast button on and spreading too much material. So we really want to calibrate and have good communication on all of that. Now, in terms of feedback, as I was getting ready for today is that we've done this webinar before and I was talking about feedback and I was thinking about temperature feedback. You know, the IR guns that sit in the front of the truck, a lot of times they're mounted actually either right on the front of the cab or even just behind the plow and gives you the pavement temperature. Cool. But there's other feedback that you can get. There are weather stations that you can have, both data from the truck and data uh, at the home base. And of course, the internet provides feedback. These are all tools. And of course, another feedback, maybe one that we all should be thinking about, is a backup camera and cameras to see all the pieces of equipment. While we're legally allowed to back up with the truck, it makes it a lot easier and safer and more efficient to have a camera. So how many of you have a camera on your equipment? How many of you have cameras? Raise your hand. Hmm. Less than I thought. Again, more and more agencies are starting to think about it. Incorporate it when you buy the equipment. It's actually easier to install it. But think about it from the standpoint of updating. Okay. And so there's a camera there. So the operator in this case can see backwards, but also he can see the spinner, which is pretty cool. He can actually see, is it clogged? Is it working? Okay. So you might want to think about that. Other equipment ideas. Let's throw out a few ideas here. And I'm just going to go ahead and get responses on here rather than, so let's see, what kind of new equipment ideas do you have out there? What have you been using or having fun with or that you'd like to share with others? Okay. What are the things that you guys can do? Y'all came to me. You want me to tell you all the new equipment ideas. I see. <clears throat> Analytics app to auto automatically document everything. Yeah, cool. Again, you can set applications up that are hooked to the truck. That'll do all the documentation. Calculate how much material. Calculate the routes. Uh, a lot of them have GPS on the trucks. So I was just about to say, thanks for beating me to the punch. That was what I was hoping. For. This is actually one of my favorite tools that I think we need to be thinking about. And of course, these can be tied to all of those sensors. The GPS on the trucks tells you where the trucks are. And I know there's some drivers, I don't want to be monitored. But if you think about it, you can go the other way. 
you can tell somebody, yeah, we know exactly where that truck was. They went by your house 45 minutes ago. They're going 20 miles an hour. They were spreading 150 pounds of material per lane mile. Oh, and by the way, the temperature was 32.5. I mean, there's really some pretty cool information. It actually is a good communication tool. Um, somebody's got a high lift with blowers, okay? There's all kinds of things that you can think about for your equipment in your fleet. And this all comes back to your overall plan. One that maybe not thinking about right now, but how do you load the trucks? One of our Build a Better Mousetrap winners this year was actually an agency that built a better way to load their trucks up and clean them off safely, rather than trying to climb up on the truck. And, and that has its own risk. So think about these kinds of things. If you're not sure, go talk to your neighbor, go to your county association meeting, go to a statewide meeting, share ideas, try something new. There's a lot of cool things that are out there. I see this field changing quite a bit over the next few years. Now, how do we decide what our application rate is? Let me just ask and see what you think. I'm going to show you a slide. You tell me what factors change your application rate. You can mark, mark all of these. Which ones? So go ahead and mark which ones you think are important. Now, for reasons the percentages are based on the totals, just you can mark all the ones you want, but let's just see what we get here. Okay. Factors that change your application rate. Okay, so some of you just use a standard. Some of you look at precipitation, yeah. Uh, route length, air temperature, pavement temperature, traffic and time of day, and the weather forecast. Okay, so these are all factors that you got. And then somebody here put in D, but again, you can put in more than one. Somebody put in D, B, D, E, and G, which is precipitation, air temperature, pavement temperature, and the weather forecast, okay? So let's talk about these things a little. Let's talk a little bit about our routes and see how we're doing here. Now, in terms of our routes, some things that affect what's going on. Well, one of the first things that we have to deal with is actually the length of the route. The length of the route actually makes more of a difference than we might think. Because remember, that's gonna affect the cycle time. And so getting from point A to point B, it could make a big difference. If your route length doubles, your time just about doubles. And of course, time of day actually makes a big difference. Not just the level of service, but think about it from the standpoint of, is it rush hour? Is there traffic getting in the way? Do you have to have a better level of service because of school buses or people trying to get to work? Maybe at night, you can get away with a little bit lower level of service, okay? Um, there's one person plowing. Oh, some agencies have incorporated one person plowing for 30, 35 years. The state DOT certainly has here in New York. Some agencies are still reluctant to do OPP. There's reasons we could argue about that. Again, in a full day class, we talk about that. The biggest thing with OPP, truth be told, with any snow plowing operations, make sure your people are trained and they know their equipment. And if you're going to set up for it, set up for it properly. Okay. So that's part of that equipment operation that you've got. Um, how many of you are using uh, one person plowing or OPP? Raise your hand here. See how many of you are, are using it. Okay. Okay. Oh, you mentioned the time of day issue. That makes a difference. Um, hills and curves. Obviously, hills and curves makes a big difference. Going down a hill, you might need to have a little bit more treatment or even to get up a steep hill. But if your area is relatively flat, you might have a different approach in terms of how much material you're dealing with. What are your curves like? Are they sharp? Or if somebody ran off the road, they're just going to be able to drive back out. So these might change your strategy and how you're going to do things. Okay, so these are things to keep in mind. Do you have any intersections you got to deal with? Okay, intersections are one of our biggest challenges because you can't just get an intersection by driving straight through. You're going to have to do the corners. You may have to back up, which is a safety concern. If you've got a roundabout or some kind of intersect, large intersection, you're going to have to plow it differently. 
In fact, for those of you who do work with designing of roundabouts, think about the plowing operation. That may be the single most challenging thing. If you can design it so it can be maintained, it's actually better for everybody. Where are they going to push that snow when they come around? Or they're just going to wind up plugging up all the entrances. A lot of agencies will actually send a plow and do a big circle and then go out each one so they clear up all the entrances and exits. But how are they going to do that? So think about that a little bit. Heck, I know some agencies in residential areas that have cul-de-sacs and they purposely plow them in the opposite direction and plow all the snow in the middle, which actually can work really well, especially if it's actually a ring, not a full uh, circle of asphalt. But where is it going to melt later on? Because it can become an ice problem. So these are things to think about. Do you have shade? Shade is going to make a big difference. If you've got sun, the sun is an amazingly good snow melter. So you've got a lot of shade. That's something you have to think. You might have to change your application rate slightly in shaded areas or roads that you know are typically shade, shady. And it could even be down to which lane you're in as much as anything else. Do you have spots that drift? Um, does that mean you need to have snow fencing or actually Flatten the slopes out if you can. That can actually make a big difference for drifting because we know that what causes the drifting in a lot of cases is a change of velocity. If everything's nice and smooth, you may get the total quantity, but you may not get as much drifting. But of course, you hit that road, and there's a ditch, winds tend to swirl, and that's where you get your drifting spots. You can actually design the road to reduce the drifting or think about putting up snow fencing or live fencing with trees and things like that. So this is, again, things to think about. And you know where those spots are if you're developing your plan. Do you allow parking on the roadway? Parking can make a huge difference in terms of what you can and can't get away with. And for those of you who have parking in an urban area or here at the university, it changes how you're going to have to attack the problem. And of course, traffic can help you. A lot of traffic can actually help keep that roadway up, in a sense, and reduce the amount of material that you have to put down to have the same effect. And of course, pedestrians and bicycles. And people are going, well, I'm not in an urban area. Probably a lot more pedestrians and bicycles than you think. And yes, they're still sometimes out there in the winter. If you've got Amish or Mennonite populations, for instance, they're going to be out there in the winter. Do you have a different plan because of that? Do you have to treat things differently? Okay. What are your spread rates and your patterns that you're using? Okay, you've been thinking about all these things, but does it change your spread rate? What equipment do you have? Can you push the material towards the center? Can you spread it out over the entire roadway surface? Can you adjust the spinner speed or control the direction and the angle? You may want to do that. Obviously, the best place to do that is try it out in your yard and get it all working. But again, what kind of equipment do you have available? We're doing a little better, I hope, than the photograph that we've got here. And of course, the weather is going to change all of this. You get a lot of snow, a lot of wet snow. You're going to have to have a different rate because it's going to dilute your material. You're going to lose the power of that salt. You're going to have to put material down. If it's heavy rate, you're going to have to put more material down. And obviously, if you've got ice, you got to deal with that in a different way. In fact, liquids don't always work real well with pure ice because they have to they sit on the surface. They don't tend to penetrate as well. So you may think about, I got to use a solid policy here. Again, your cycle time, which goes back to route length, traffic, all those things make a difference. The longer the cycle time, bigger things are going to happen. Interestingly enough, we always talk about air temperature. And you can use air temperature as a surrogate. But the air temperature is not the most critical thing 90% of the time. There's one big exception. It's the pavement temperature we really care about. In fact, even in that one exception, it's the pavement temperature you need to know. That's why those feedback temperature sensors on the truck can be so critical because they can alert the driver. They can let the operator know, hey, this pavement temperature is suddenly now below freezing. And that, of course, means you're prone to black ice situation, which is where that air temperature thing can come into play. Where the pavement's below freezing, the air temperature is above, and you can grid black ice kind of situation because material will freeze as it hits, even if it's in a liquid form. And so pavement temperature is really the single most important value. But you can use air temperature as a surrogate. And of course, forecast of the air temperature is all we get. We don't get pavement temperature forecast. 
probably should, but we get air temperature forecast. So how's that going to affect the pavement temperature? Because that really controls all the rates. And then, of course, I already mentioned traffic, but the kind of traffic can make a difference as well. Trucks versus cars, low speed versus high speed. And what material are you using? If you've got the right material, is it liquid? Is it solid? Is it pre-wet? Is it a mixture of sand and salt? Is it just pure chemical? All things are going to change. So this is what we got before. Everybody can remember that. I'm going to clear the responses. And I want to see what you think now. What would you like to be thinking about now that we're moving forward? Let's see if we get a different set of results. What are you going to think about in changing your yeah, precipitation type? Air and pavement should be in there. We should get a little more for pavement. Though, so again, you want to have air in there. Yeah, all of these things matter. We really probably shouldn't have a standard application rate because it's really going to vary. Now, you may have a system that's small enough or consistent enough where you can get away with a standard application rate, but be very wary that as precipitation changes and the type changes, you're definitely going to have to adjust to deal with that. Okay? Now, let's see here. Let's talk about emergencies. Okay? The two most common emergencies we'll deal with are crashes and major storms. Okay. Interestingly enough, they have very different attack strategies. A crash is an isolated small event. Okay. Most of the time, our job as first responders, and that's what we are, first responders, is to get out there and make things safe. That may be one piece of equipment, but that one piece of equipment to deal with water on the surface of the roadway or to deal with a slick spot can be very, very important versus a major storm where you may want to be ready for it ahead of time. You may want to pre-stay. Big enough storm, you'll sometimes know they're coming. Not always, but you'll usually know they're coming. And so you want to get ready for that event and be ready to go with longer cycles with your crews or bring people in from other areas if you have to or deal with your neighbors and partners for those of you who are with the municipality. Okay? So think about that. How do we communicate? Do we have a plan for that? Do we have an emergency management plan? And then, of course, we can get ice storms, which are their own animal. And hopefully, knock on wood, none of us get an ice storm this year because they're one of the hardest things to deal with, okay? Where it knocks out power, that means you need to have a generator. All kinds of things change when you get a major, major storm. Are you ready for that next emergency, okay? Now, you may have to have some specialized equipment. Uh, how many of you have a uh, snow-go or rotary a snow thrower? How many of you have one? Raise your hand if you have one. A few of you do? Okay. Okay, so just a few if you have a snow thrower. Okay, I'll lower your hands here. And then I'm going to ask how many of you have a V plow? How many of you have a V plow in the system? Not the painted one out front that's got the name of the department. An active, actually ready to use V plow. Nobody raised their hand up. Oh, oh, we have one person put it in there. They have a V-plot. The key is if you've got a specialized piece of equipment that isn't used every single year, get it out, test it, make sure it actually works at least once a year, maybe even twice, especially if it's something like the rotary throws snow goes that actually runs because you don't want to find out it doesn't work right or something's broken as the storm's approaching or worse during the storm. So if you're gonna have it as part of your strategy, you need to be ready to use it. You know, If you're gonna hook things onto a grader or a loader in a big event, do you know how to do that? Does it actually work? Have suddenly something's changed and all of a sudden things don't hook up anymore. So keep these things in mind. If you're gonna have specialty equipment that's not used on a regular basis, check it out and make sure you're running it. Make sure it does what it's supposed to do. You got an emergency management center. You probably should have a practice run with it. Make sure it's in good shape. And since snow and ice is one of our biggest emergencies, maybe that'd be a good exercise to do for this year. Okay. Shared services. We have to do shared services. And and I don't care if it's state versus county, like we have here in this photograph, where it's Jefferson County loading a state truck, 
whether we've got towns and villages working together, or what happens if a barn burns down. We need to be sure. And more and more, obviously, these things need to be in writing. But the key is we need to be talking and communicating with each other. Being able to pick up the phone makes a big difference. So in terms of your policy, again, you can't handle every single event. There are going to be times when you just have to just go, mea culpa, we can't handle it. So communicate. Make sure the public understands this was an event that was just completely beyond what's expected. But it better be one that really is beyond what is expected. So why would you want a written policy for snow and ice? Why would that be a really good idea? What's, what's the reason behind that? Give me some thoughts. You get documentation later on, can protect you, can reduce your liability. Yep, somebody put in liability, you were probably typing it. You have proof of what your plan is if you follow that plan. It sets the expectations. Well, I like that one. It says with the public, with the board, it can help you from a budgeting standpoint to know what you're probably going to spend. And a communications tool. If you're with a town and you're an elected town highway superintendent, it can make a huge difference. You can actually run on that. Hey, we have a policy. We have a plan. We're ready to go. Okay. So there's lots of reasons. The big ones in my mind are liability, economics, actually. Helps you with reimbursement, which is part of the economics. But as much as anything, it's a communication tool to improve safety. Okay. Now, if you don't have a plan, we have one you can use as a starting point. It's available on our website. The handout that was in the chat pod, and by magic, I'm going to ask Amanda to throw it back in the chat pod because some of you have forgot, probably forgotten this. We actually have a draft one you can start with. Don't use it as a final. Don't just take it and make it yours. Take it, modify it to match your own conditions, and get yourself a plan in place. And you got time to do that. Okay? So I'm um, going to ask you a few questions to finish up, okay? And by the way, the chat pot now has it in there, okay? And by the way, Bill put in there a really cool thing. Remember, a good plan is going to help you with uh, operational plans as well with your crew. That's a great, great thing. So which of these is least important in determining the chemical application rate? Yeah. I'm not saying you shouldn't take the air temperature. It can be part of it. But yeah, air temperature is the least important. If I had to pick only three, I would want to know the type, snow, ice, sleet, heavy snow, things like that, the rate, the cycle time for my route, and the pavement temperature, okay? But again, you're going to get air temperature, so use it, but realize it may not tell you what's going on on the pavement, okay? Stopping distance is shortest on which surface condition? Soft, loose snow. Slushy road with no bonded ice, snowpack, ice, or none of the above. Stopping is the shortest on which surface condition. In other words, I slam on the brakes. Well, hopefully I slam them on. I'm going to stop the fastest on which of these four. Not ice. I'll give you that hint. There we go, it's not ice. The shortest distance. Yeah, slush you over no bonded ice. So you can get down, your tires can actually get to the pavement. But obviously, I'm making an assumption that it's not so deep a snow that you couldn't get down, that your tires can get down to the actual road surface and get that friction going on. If it's fairly deep with slush, it's not gonna be great. And of course, any of these can have icy spots within them. So just keep that in mind. And yes, I'd love to say that we'll just get the public to slow down, but I don't think that's always going to happen like we'd like it to. A bare road policy is always recommended for high volume roads. Is that true or false? And I know a lot of you are going to put this is an opinion poll. This is not uh, something we can we could actually debate this a little bit if we want to. This is something I think we need to talk about. Um, and it's a discussion that we're not going to have today, um, but we need to think about. Is that a really a good policy for high volume roadways? That's what the public wants. And they want it on the interstate. They want it on the throughway. But uh, is that really the right thing from an economic standpoint? Is it the right thing from a safety standpoint? 
do we have to realize there may be times when it's not there? And how quickly can you make them there? So again, something to think about. What roads are you willing to put the money, the effort, the time, and the environmental damage into to keep them there? Okay. Now, in terms of our fall season, I wanted to make sure I ended with this. We are doing our snow and ice class in five places around the state. Those are the ones in purple that you see there. So we're going to be over in Warren County, Montgomery County, Sullivan County, Monroe County, and Cattaraugus County uh, starting this year. They're actually being held after the uh, highway school. Uh, winter has been starting later, so we're taking a bit of a risk, but hopefully that'll work out. Okay. Uh, we do have two more Y webinars that I mentioned, and we are already starting to plan next year's Y webinars. Uh, this is the list of them. In your handout is a list of all of the webinars that we're going to be holding starting after the workshop season is done. We don't have the schedule yet. We'll be developing that schedule. We have a draft, but we'll have a final schedule released sometime early this fall, and that will be available to you. So again, Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions, have any thoughts, please send them our way. You can go to our website. You can search for Cornell Local Roads. You can search for NYSL TAP. You can search for David Orr. Actually, you'll get a guide out Overland if you're not careful and you do that. Um, but you can find us on the web. And we have a lot of extensive materials. All the things that are in those resources are available. And everybody have yourself a great day. Bye-bye.